Next up, we have Cosmos in her combat frame. Uh, this frame, created by the second R&D division on Second Militia during the Cosmos operations or operating system test, OS test, that's operating system, right? Uh, Vector staff refer to it as version 2, just in time for Xenosaga episode 2. Although this, this model is uh, even more updated as far as I can tell. In order to shield her internal organs from shocks delivered to the outer body during combat, her body was filled with fluorescent blue antinosis gel. The Hilbert emission device, which had taken the form of a visor in version 1, was miniaturized and installed into her forehead. Her body was designed with the implementation of the tertiary weapon system in mind. Its resilience was increased dramatically. So there is an actual reason why the sprite for Cosmos changed so dramatically between episodes 1 and 2. And that's apparently because they worked on her more and improved her. We have the technology. Next up we have just plain old Cosmos, a female-shaped ba battle android developed by the interplanetary conglomerate Vector Industries, a being created entirely from mechanical parts exceptionally rare in this era of advanced Realian technology. Remember that Realians are made from organic parts. In all matters, she places priority on the three fundamentals of logic, efficiency, and duty, and she protects her creator Xion unconditionally. She is equipped with an artificial personality operating system in hopes of facilitating smooth communications with others, and her tone is that of an android subservient to humans. I've always questioned that. I would rather deal with a computer than somebody with a fake personality. Maybe that's just me. As she is actually just prioritizing logic and efficiency, however, she can often be difficult to handle. Like, once again, maybe that's because of the interface that I have to use with her. Cosmos is the term applied to the entire Antinosis combat system. It stands for Cosmos Obey Strategical Multiple Operation Systems. Once again, it's weird that it's an, uh, what do you call it? In, not an anagram. Oh my god, it's an acronym. There we go. Uh, an acronym and the word, the actual acronym itself is the first letter in the acronym. It's it's just weird how that's set up. She currently uses the cutting edge version 3 body, luckily just in time for this version of the game. That probably is what she's going to be looking like in this game. Should we ever meet her again? I assume we're going to meet her again. Uh, complete with multiple upgrades based on battle data gathered from version 2, except, you know, she's not as good as she was then, or at least at the end of the game. While the basic construction is the same as in version 2, the latest parts have been implemented in the primary armor, frame, and drive system, yielding a pronounced increase in battle capabilities, but a lower level. Next up, we have Shelly. Shelly Godwin, a mutant. I didn't realize she was a mutant. A mutant born through life recycling, secretary to Gun and Kukai, and the Durandal's operator. Does Professor X know about her? She administrates the workings of the ship according to Junior's orders. An intelligent woman with cool-headed and precise judgment. Uh, that That's not a complete sentence. All right, I thought I missed something there. All right, it's just not a sentence. Practically a sister to Mary, who shares her origins, she is able to communicate telepathically with Mary via interlink. However, they are not uh, sisters. Originally an illegal test subject of a pharmaceutical company, oh, great, uh, she and Mary now reside in the Kukai Foundation after being taken in by Guinan. Apparently pharmaceutical companies. They do experiments in the future that are even worse than they're supposed to do now. Uh, Xion, we have seen. Yes, we read Xion. We have not seen Ziggy, though. Once again, we don't get much information on Ziggy. It was all in Pied Piper. After his death in the line of duty in TC-4667 at the age of 30, his remains were donated for body augmentation. He resumed his post two years later as a battle cyborg. His current posting is sub contact subcommittee member Yuli Mizrahi. His name in life was Jan Sauer. Really, that's all you're going to give us on Ziggy? That's disappointing. All right, now we got Junior. 
a survivor of the URTVs, the special group of people created based on data collected from Udu, the discarnate entity that threatened the Galaxy Federation in the past, in order to be its anti-existence. His official name is URTV unit number 666, Rubido. I, I probably don't need to point out what the number 666 means, but uh, it doesn't mean good things. He was born from the same embryo as URTV unit number 667, Albedo. So they're... Wait, if they're in the same embryo, doesn't that make them identical twins? Whatever. He has the ability to activate the special anti-Udu waveform mode, Red Dragon, which causes mutual destruction upon contact with Udu. In order to contain that dual-edged power, Junior has half-subconsciously halted the development of his own body. How do you half subconsciously do something? However, as this mutual destruction extends only to Junior and the observational terminal part of Udu, from a cost-benefit perspective, his powers cannot be called a complete anti-Udu solution. So, in case you were wondering or throwing a fit about why doesn't uh, Junior just destroy himself and thus destroy Udu, it wouldn't work. He, he wouldn't actually destroy all of Udu, just, uh, just one little part of it. Next we have Jin. As you can see, he's gotten a little bit more rugged since the last game. At least his jawline has gotten a little bit more rugged. Former captain of the Galaxy Federation Special Ops Intelligence Bureau, older brother of Xion. Upon the military, he was ranked directly under Margulis and was Pelligree's superior. He and Margulis both learned swordsmanship under Gr Jin's grandfather. I'm going to say Uga. Uzuki. And I'm not going to address it again. After becoming aware of Margulis's treachery during the motion conflict, Jin began his own secret information activities under then-Lieutenant General Helmer. His relationship with Chaos also began during this period, which we experienced at the beginning of game number two. Next we have Scott, who I'm sure many of you don't remember. Uh, a young man originally from planet Bretza, this is assistant Scott, as in the professor, uh, the robot professor's assistant. This is Scott, originally only visiting the Kukai Foundation out of his interest in lost Jerusalem era antiques. He found it so comfortable there that he stayed on. Later, finding a kindred spirit in an elderly man at the Iron Bar, he moved in at the Robot Academy and now works night and day as the elderly professor's assistant researching giant robots. A huge fan of liquor, despite his reserved appearance. Apparently, if you're a huge fan of liquor, you don't have a reserved appearance. Next up, we have Dmitry Yuriev. He looks like an older version of, well, Albedo Jr. and Negredo and Guinan. He looks like an older one of all of them. I wonder why. Former Galaxy Federation Parliament member and donor of the genes used in URTVs like Junior and Guinan. Well, that would explain it. They're pretty much clones of him. Quite influential during his time in Parliament, he retains many connections within the Federation to this day. Though said to have died prior to the Milchian conflict, he stepped back onto the public stage at the time of the Ormus-caused space-time anomaly in Milchian space, the end of Episode 2. An ambitious man and a schemer. He operates a private research facility, the Yuriev Institute. After his awakening, he takes control of the Salvatore faction in Parliament, as well as military forces and moves to secure the Zohar. Currently possessing the body of URTV survivor Guinan Kukai, he grips the reins of the Zohar project. So he's after the Zohar too. Everybody wants that Zohar. Uh, Doctus. Yeah, we went over her. We went over here. Next up, we have Tony. We don't get a last name for Tony. He's the helmsman of the Kukai Foundation civilian cargo and passenger spaceship Elsa. Yeah, he's the pilot on the Elsa. While gentlemanly in appearance, his personality visibly shifts to that of a daredevil once he grips the helm. I don't know, doesn't he not have sleeves on his shirt? Uh, he is the childhood friend of Hammer, the navigator. Nonetheless, his self-labeled best-in-space piloting technique really is top class and has gotten the Elsa through countless dangerous situations in the past. 
I can think of like five. Uh, despite his gruff way of speaking and other roguish tendencies, his good nature and constant consideration for others inspire trust in everyone around him. He exhibits a belief in the supernatural by his exaggerated respect for the dead and his habit of chanting, of chanting, Our Father, who art in heaven, when in a pinch. I don't remember him doing that. An unrivaled womanizer. It's about time you addressed that. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, that is a very standard, at least Catholic, uh, prayer. The Our Father. Uh, we have to do it every Mass. This is coming from somebody that went to Catholic school for like five years. Every Mass. Uh, and then it's also penance. I, I assume a lot of other Christian religions use the same prayer, but uh, there's probably a couple that don't. But very, very Christian pr prayer. Very Catholic from my perspective as well. Next up we have Nephilim. There are definitely some questions about her. The illusionary girl who repeatedly appears before Xion with the sound of a chime. She repeatedly offers Xion advice in an adult matter incongruous with her appearance, though her motives are unclear. She exists as a consciousness in imaginary space with no material body, despite what it said earlier. Apparently, we were talking about two different Nephilims. Uh, she is unable to physically interfere with the material world. When Xion performed an encephalon dive into Cosmos's mainframe, Nephilim encouraged Xion to take action by showing her scenes of the past and of Udu's possible future resurrection, and by assuring her that the future could still be changed. Uh, they're glossing over it here. Uh, we saw a big battle uh, between Udu and Cosmos, and... Uh, that's what scared Xion the most, was that Cosmos was somehow involved in, like, massive destruction. Uh, but yes, despite what uh, we heard in the, uh, the, deba the database entry that took place between episode 2 and 3, the story entry there, uh, Nephilim is not a reality. <laughs> that was a completely different Nephilim. Um, but uh, the, the name being the same is not coincidental, but yeah, she is, she is a consciousness in imaginary space, which if you remember is also where the Gnosis are. They're in imaginary space. I don't know if it's the same imaginary space, but it's imaginary space. All right, moving on. Now we have the professor. His real name is Hakshin White, genius scientist who graduated at the top of his class at the University of Borromeo, because that's the only university. After graduation, he was scouted by Vector and a number of other top-tier research and development companies. He rejected all of their offers, however, and disappeared. He met Xion and the others after establishing the dubious research facility known as Robot Academy on the Kukai Foundation. Later, that fateful meeting became the key to accomplishing his dream of creating an indestructible giant robot known as Erde Kaiser. And also Erde Kaiser Fury, but uh, apparently we're not going to acknowledge its existence because not very many people got it in the second game. Next up, we have Hammer, navigator of the Kukai Foundation, civilian cargo and passenger spaceship Elsa. Yeah, he's the navigator. A renowned hacker as a teenager, he got cocky and made a move on a certain criminal organization's database and became targeted for retribution as a result. Saved by Matthews, their relationship has continued since then. He is a childhood friend of Tony, the helmsman. So Matthews grabbed childhood friends and said, they will make up my crew. Even though his navigational stills are top class and he has the trust of Matthews and Tony, people often assume that he is just a clown upon first meeting him, perhaps because of his levity. While his flippant remarks often incite Matthews' anger, they appear to consider that a part of the bond they share. Ir irrepressibly curious, he actively tries to get involved in everything, though he's also timid and often has reservations, quick to back out of what he's gotten himself into. I don't see any references there, to be honest with you. All right, next up we have Fibronia. Fibronia was important. I don't know how much uh, more important she's going to be as we continue on, though. Uh, she is a realian who appears repeatedly before Xion. She begs Xion to save her younger sisters and asks that Xion destroy the Zohar control system and change the future for the sake of all consciousness, both those of mankind and those of things. Apparently, things have a consciousness these days. I assume she's talking about realians. 
Next up, we have Pellegree. She is the Inquisitor of the secret society Ormus. She commands the Utic organization and Ormus's workforces as Margulis's right hand. Through her, though her speech and conduct give the impression that she is a moderate, she is ruthless in her efforts to accomplish the organization's goals. Like Margulis, she gives her all as an inquisitor in order to facilitate a return to the holy motherland of lost Jerusalem. Is that their goal? Apparently that's their goal. They want to go back to Lost Jerusalem. Next up we have Margulis. He is the chief inquisitor of the secret society Ormus. Publicly, he holds the title of commander-in-chief of the Utic organization. So he's head of Utic and arguably in head of Ormus as well. A merciless... Wait, whoa. Went too far there. Whoa, there we go. A merciless master of the sword with exceptional battle prowess and a crystal clear judgment, the leadership he displays within Ormus beneath his lofty ideals is absolute. Muscular in structure, his cheeks sport a large scar. That scar was given to him by Jinazuki's sword 15 years earlier during the Milshin conflict, during a cutscene, after I almost kicked his ass. As a youth, both he and Jinazuki trained in the sword under Jin's grandfather. It is said that, at the time, Margulis's skill surpassed that of Jin, but Jin caught up pretty damn quick. Upon becoming colonel of the Galaxy Federation Special Ops, he receives orders from Heinlein in his capacity as a member of Ormus and begin, began secret intelligence activities in earnest. Uh, don't confuse Heinlein with Helmer like I did the first time that I played this. Uh, they are two entirely different people. Heinlein uh, is secret, right? He's an Ormus. Helmer is... Uh, well, he's the black guy that, that says Udu really well, and he's a public official, so not to be confused at all. The events that occurred during that time tied Margulis and Jin together with strong bonds of fate. He pledged loyalty to Cardinal Heinlein in hopes of a return to the Holy Motherland of Lost Jerusalem. So Cardinal Heinlein, as in, well, as in the Catholic Church version of a uh, of a cardinal, which is second in line to be pope. Uh, pope is chosen from the cardinals. So he's high up in, in the organization, in the immigrant fleet. Then we have Matthews. I wonder how much debt he has. Captain of the Kukai Foundation, civilian cargo and passenger spaceship, Elsa. Formerly a member of the Galaxy Federation government's naval forces, he later became a so-called recycler. He's a scavenger, uh, roaming through space collecting, repairing, and reselling military goods. The last few years, however, have mainly been filled with work for the Foundation, the Kukai Foundation. A natural leader filled with a sense of social duty, he is quick to step forward to protect the people he knows when danger threatens. However, the fact that his actions are currently driven by the need to repay a huge amount of debt is somewhat pathetic, even though I paid it off, damn. Damn you. <laughs> Do you know how much I worked? They're not gonna pretend that I did it. A wasteful spender, he is constantly in debt. He is especially deep in debt to the Kukai Foundation. Even his beloved swan-like ship has been put up as collateral. Like, he mortgaged it. That's not that big of a deal. Uh, he has a rustic and hearty personality and is also an unparalleled lush. I don't know what that means, to be honest with you. His love of liquor is such that he created a bar within his ship. Even in an era of technology as advanced as the Encephalon, his interests run toward the nostalgic, such as wanting to attend live concerts. Honestly, with the Encephalon, there's really not that much point, but maybe they, they feel a difference. All right. Uh, we saw Miyuki, right? Yeah, we saw Miyuki.